Hey everyone, uh, welcome to this workshop where you are going to learn all about composition and it's going really great. Uh, I know composition is one of those really foundational things that you definitely want to learn and you want to uh, see what the rules are and and uh, and then at some point maybe even break the rules. So. Um, we are going to get started here. Um, I want you to know that there is a live chat, uh, so you can ask questions and we'll be able to answer questions. Uh, and at the end, we're going to have a long um, Q&A uh, time where whatever questions you have, we will be here to answer. So Jake, do you want to say hello to everyone um, who is manning the, the chat, the live chat over there? What's up, beautiful creatives of the world? We are super excited to uh, share with you guys how to master composition and understand composition, really, because it's such an important component of art. Um, and yeah, this will be a lot of fun. I'll be saving all of your questions throughout the chat. So if you have questions, um, feel free to you know just throw them in the chat, and then I'll save them and ask Ellie and Dimitra them on behalf of you um, during the Q&A session at the end of the chat. So we are both really excited to get started, and before we get into everything that we have planned to talk to you guys today about, um, we just want to share briefly about who we are, because we know there's probably a lot of new people here who have never been to workshops, so we just want to um, share a little bit about our stories and how we got started as artists. Yeah, so my name is Ellie Milan, and I have been a professional artist since 1996, so that is quite a while. And I married an artist, so this is John, my husband. Uh, that is our winter ball picture when I was a senior in high school. So, uh, and then um, later, you know, after we grew up a little bit. Uh, so he is also an artist, and we spent a lot of our career uh, collaborating. Uh, we also, you know, I would paint my work, he would paint his work, and then we also collaborated. And we both uh, have been professional artists all this time. Uh, we have four children. So Dimitra is my oldest daughter and uh, she'll tell you a little bit about her story. So we got started in the decorative market uh, where we just painted basically uh, artwork for art dealers uh, and art consultants, um, designers. Uh, they were in you know hotels and restaurants and banks and things like that. Uh, also just sold to uh, individuals or through interior decorators. Um, we got involved in publishing and licensing uh, where a lot of our images were uh, made into lithographs or other products. Uh, and uh, we worked with licensing agents and different publishers um, in the art world that would publish our artwork. Um, then we started uh, kind of crossing over into the more collectible market. So that is, you know, more uh, fine art galleries and that type of thing where we would work directly with uh, the gallery owners and they would sell our work for us. So we were in many, many galleries, uh, really all over the United States, a little bit in, in Europe. Um, and this is an example of some of the work as it's evolved over, you know, almost 30 years. Um, in the course of our career, we've sold over 10,000 paintings, uh, my husband and I together, uh, and some of those were mine, some were his, some were uh, collaborations, uh, and, um, you know, I'm, I think that's a, a big accomplishment to even paint 10,000 paintings, much less sell them. So, um, uh, and along the way, uh, because of this success, a lot of artists were asking us, how, how do you do it and help me? I want to learn how to turn my passion for art into a profession. Uh, they wanted to ditch their day jobs and be able to paint full time because they saw that both of us were able to stay home with our kids and our studio and paint and raise our children and, and sell our art for a living. So we, um, in 2010, started Milan Art Institute. Um, with that in mind, we wanted to equip artists and train them to be able to have a full time career uh, selling their art. And um, the program that, that I created uh, for that is called the Mastery Program. And it's a one-year program that will help you uh, learn everything you need to know um, to become a professional artist, even the skills. Uh, so you, in this program, uh, you actually learn how to draw, how to paint, uh, and how to market and sell your artwork. And more, most importantly, to be able to find your voice and, and um, 
have a style. So that started in 2014. Uh, Dimitra, my daughter here, uh, she joined and uh, because she had tremendous success from a very young age and knew a different type of selling art that, that I, I knew. I kind of knew the old system, you know, of, the, of working with galleries and dealers and, and she uh, really flourished in social media. And so um, we became partners in the school and she helped teach a lot of the classes, worked with the students and brought in her knowledge from her experience. Um, and it's been, it's been great. I've learned a lot from her. So, uh, oops, okay. here you go. I'll just share really briefly on um, how I got started. So I started painting shortly after they opened the art school and just took as many classes as I want, as I could, and um, just really got into art and became really passionate about it. And um, eventually I found my style after painting for like three years straight, I found a style. Um, I wish I could have taken the master program, but we didn't have it then. So if we would have that's what I would have done. But this was my first painting that I had in a gallery show that really launched my career because a publishing company in Hawaii saw um, this uh, article over here um, in the left and reached out to me wanting to work with me. And I said yes. And so this is, this is one of my most popular paintings. Um, but I just started really creating this big cohesive body of work and um, the publishers would take my work and put it in galleries and make prints. And I did that for about two years. And um, in my first year, sold over a million dollars worth of art. And so I was starting to feel a little bit like kind of on this machine and there really wasn't room for growth because I could only paint so fast. And they're only, the publisher's only um, you know, business model was just put me in as many galleries as possible. And that was kind of maxed out. And that was that. So I felt like I was at this crossroad where, where if I wanted to see myself grow and evolve and, you know, make more money selling my art, I had to um, self-represent. And meanwhile, my social media was really growing and taking off and I couldn't sell my art to those people. I had to only sell it in the galleries. So now um, I self-represent and I did that at 17 and um, I'm still selling most of my art online through my website, through social media, um, and also balancing that with uh, a few galleries. But just really connecting with collectors one-on-one -on -one and um, keeping those relationships alive. And I really think that's the future for artists. So it's very exciting. And here's some of my, some of my work today. And, um, I, oh, I guess... There was a slide missing, but I do teach the mastery program now and help other artists, like she said, um, just start doing this full time and really love what they're doing. So here is just an overview of what we're going to talk about today in composition. Um, I feel like composition is really um, just like a key to creating a good painting and consistently creating paintings that eventually are, are going to sell because they have this very pleasing um, aspect to them. And so understanding composition is really crucial as an artist. Mm -hmm. So we're going to go through, um, just some different guidelines. We're going to show you a lot of examples of do's and don'ts, and then go into the golden ratio and divine proportions, um, which is super interesting. And once yeah. we learned about that, it just kind of opened your eyes to like so many new things. Um, and then that each of us have a composition inside of us. So that's also really cool. Yeah, and then um, after that, we're gonna also share, um, so you wanna stick around for this, uh, uh, artwork that we've sold that we believe really quickly because of good composition, and then artwork that either took forever to sell or still hasn't sold, um, and we believe maybe because of uh, some bad composition. So we're gonna share some of our work of good composition and some examples where we blew it. So. Uh, no matter how accomplished you are as an artist, um, it's rare that you'll nail composition every time. I mean, mm -hmm. as we were putting this together, we were looking at old masters artwork and there's a lot of them that have some 
you know, pretty bad compositions at times. Yeah. Not every time, but you, you do see that slip in occasionally. So the idea is, though, that if you learn it and you kind of learn the rules um, and how it functions, then um, you can hit those good compositions most of the time and, um, you know, sell more artwork. Um, your artwork will be more pleasing to people mm -hmm. when they look at it. And, you know, overall, it'll improve your skills. Yeah. So... The goals of good composition is you want the eye to travel around. Uh, you don't just want to go right for a bullseye and just stay there. You want the eye to look all throughout the painting and then settle somewhere um, and, uh, and stay engaged in the painting and not leave. Um, some compositions take you out of the painting and then you, if you're in a gallery, right, because if you want to sell your artwork in a gallery, your goal is to draw the client off the street which is going to happen from composition, uh, into the gallery, see your painting and stay engaged and not leave and go to a competitor's painting next door, right? So um, you also want composition um, to feel pleasant when you look at it, to be easy to look at, mm -hmm. but also dynamic. There should be some energy to it and not a static, something kind of static to look at, dynamic, but easy to look at. Um, and then you want something that looks great up close, but also looks great from far away. Uh, so uh, those, that would be the goals of, of good composition. Mm -hmm. um, so I want you to keep in mind, this has always sort of helped me when I'm constructing my paintings, is I try to think of myself as like the director of a movie. And even though I've never directed a movie, uh, far from it, I've never even seen somebody direct a movie, I'm using my imagination of how I imagine a director is, is utilizing tools to direct a movie. And, uh, you know, you have sort of your, your main actress um, who's there and imagine you're creating a scene in a movie where there's the main actress and, and her lover and, and they're embracing and that's the focal point. And then there's a backdrop behind them or a background. Maybe they're in a cafe and there's a street scene. And so you have extras and you have um, you know, distance and far, far away depth thing, things in the depth, uh, that, that is the backdrop. And then you usually have sort of a secondary focal point, um, that that's in there. That's not equal to, that's not as strong as the main focal point, but, but it is, it's there. And all these things are designed to lead you to the focal point, to the main, the main thing that you want them to look at while your eye is traveling around and, and there's this dynamic look. So one of the very best um, compositional uh, artists, you know, old master that, that I really admire is Caravaggio. So if you look at this painting here, um, it's a narrative painting. And if you look at how your eye is brought in based on the cropping, based on color, based on the lines, um, the arm that's down, uh, what you see is, um, you know, here he's holding cards, right? But you don't notice that at first. That's something that you arrive at. That's sort of your, as the narrative is, un oopsie, as the narrative is unfolding. I wish the little thing would, I know. it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. So um, here we, we immediately come in here because all surrounding this um is you know a lot of darkness and then this hand is like really brightly lit so you come in here because this angle draws you down and then you go up and you see he's holding cards you see the look on his face and then your eye goes up here you see he's looking and then you see oh he's giving this guy a signal of some sort you mm. see that he is he's you know maybe poor like a servant um but he's he's pulling the fast one and then you see him and these lines lead you right here and now you see he has cards hiding behind your his back so the whole thing draws you in a circle and as your eye travels you get this sort of revelation and even if you missed it the first time you have a round a second round because your eye just keeps going round and round and round um and as you look you discover something new every time and i think that's absolutely magical mm -hmm. because on a still picture it's not a movie it's not a film 
But on just a 2D painting, the artist was the director of the movie, and he drew you in. He knew exactly where you would look first. He knew where you would look second and third and fourth, and the narrative unfolded right before your eyes. And even if you didn't catch it right away, you had more chances to see it. And so I think it's really, really um, an amazing testimony of the power of composition and what it can really do um, to to speak, to give your work voice, to give it you know, something uh, really powerful. So um, always keep in mind you, if you want to, if you choose to, you can step into that role and be the director of a movie and lead your audience how you want. So when composition is off, you can feel it right away. And um, so oftentimes if you just look at a painting and just something about it, maybe it's painted really beautifully, but something about it just feels off to you, then it's probably the composition. Um, so looking at these two pictures, it's it's clear that those aren't good, great composition. It just has um, this tension in it. So that's what you're going to feel. Um, do you want to explain about this slide? Yeah. So we're we're going to go through some um, over the next several slides. We're going to go through some like compositional do's and don'ts. So some of these will be what to do and what not to do, uh, and we'll explain it as we go. Um, this is a really good do or do or don't. So you have um, you know, the A composition, it's really, really, you know, crowded. It has this like symmetrical, the symmetry to it. Um, and so it feels very, very crowded, very stagnant. There's like no room to breathe. Mm -hmm. There's no expanse. Um, and you're just kind of feeling locked in and it, it just is unsettling. Whereas on the bottom, um, they're following what we're going to show you later, uh, you know, partially rule of thirds combined with divine proportion. And so it just immediately when you look at that, you're like, oh, OK, it's calming. It, yeah. it just like what Dimitri was saying, it makes you feel settled and relaxed and calm. Um, it feels right. So um, we're going to talk about tangent edges. Do you want to talk about tangent edges? Sure. So we say this a lot um, in the mastery program too, but with tangent edges, it's very, this is, this is a very common mistake that we see people do because, um, you know, it's a lot of smaller objects or, you know, just things that are like kind of o overlapping, but almost touching. And um, over here by the, on the left, under this vase here, the, like this whole area with the fruit, it's just kind of like just feeling a little edgy. And then here Do you it's think almost they can touching. See the mouse? Can yeah. they see them? Okay, you guys? good. Okay, good. Over here it's almost touching. So Ooh. there's a lot of spot spots. It's so edgy. This area is better. See, this is like overlapping. But overall, like look at the table, it's like tilted and the all pictures these, right in the middle. All these lines are really uncomfortable. So just looking at that, you're like, oh, something's off. Even the drawer is tangent to the edge. Yeah. So keeping, like, thinking about the edges of your canvas, too, is really important, and we'll talk more about that later. But this um, composition with, there's all kinds of lines happening in, in different edges, but it's very pleasing and easy to look at, and it just feels well, right. Well, this is tangent here. Is What is tangent? The house. The house is, like, I. this is a... a oh, that's a house. I thought that was just, I didn't even see the house. Yeah. Well, I thought that was abstract. <laughs> <laughs> no, so yeah, it's it's also tangent because uh, the okay. way that her, it all lines up at the horizon line, and and then basically the whole hmm. um, bottom right corner is kind of cut off by that diagonal line, and um, everything just lines up too much. Well, this was one that we weren't <laughs> on the same page about, but that's okay. <laughs> well, it's a lot better in that one. It but, is better. I love. Yeah. I guess I like the way it's painted. Also, yeah, it is. So. It's cool. Okay. Both of these have a lot of tangent edges again, like with uh -huh. the vases, everything is just lined up just so where they're almost touching and having just a tiny bit of overlap isn't enough to, to make it better. So, um, you want things to like overlap a lot. You want things in the distance and in the foreground. Yeah. And it gives this feeling of, you know, being crowded. Yeah. Um, now this has no overlap and, um, we would call, uh, the area here, um, you know, a tangent edge because it's yeah. almost touching. And when something is almost touching, you just, it makes you feel edgy um, looking at it mm -hmm. because you, your mind just goes, oh, overlap. So um, even here with the grape leaf, yeah. it doesn't even touch the bottle. Right. So, yeah. 
So um, not having any overlap uh, at all and just kind of placed objects with no overlap is not a good composition um, or almost touching or touching right at the tangent edge. So that's the things that you want to think about with placement. Mm -hmm. So here there's also a lot of, um, in both pieces, like weird overlap. Um, are these, this lines, these lines aren't no, part of the painting. That's just showing. Showing yeah. something compositional. So when things, look like when it's hard to understand, like if you have a lot of, like in this painting, there's multiple figures and you don't really notice that person at first, but then it just looks like she has a third leg or something. It's just, um, you want your composition to be clear. You don't want people confused or thinking like something strange is happening. Yeah, and the one on the the right is is just very strange overlap. Um, yeah, the one dark. gentleman looks like he's kind of growing out of the other. Um, mm -hmm. And the, what would be better yes. is if if there were overlap and depth between them. Like one was sitting further back, and maybe one was leaning up on the table. Um, but that that just doesn't work. And then you have three objects that don't overlap each no, other. It's very at weird all. feeling. Um, you almost wonder if it was intentional though, because is that an avocado? No, that's not an avocado. It's like a plate with the. You don't even the know whole painting's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so these are pleasing paintings with multiple objects that don't have those tangent edges. So um, looking at this composition, um, you know, everything there, it's very dynamic, your, it, your eyes moving around and you have, you know, this is like in the foreground, that's in the background, everything's overlapping. Um, and even though this is off to the side, that doesn't feel weird at all because the edges are so soft and blurry. So there's so many different ways to work with your edges mm -hmm. and that comes in with learning you know the right skills for that um same with the fish this is kind of the focal point or maybe over here is the focal point but yeah so um these are also good examples this is or no overlap. yeah i thought that one was okay so these have like you know there's a space in between everything so that's uncomfortable um it's so much better if um the fish were different sizes and um also the fact that they're small down here and bigger up here that's kind of weird you'd think mm -hmm. it'd be the other way around mm -hmm. so um just a little bit more about placement um whenever you're working with an animal or a figure any kind of living being i think even flowers it sort of it sort of works as well um you want to have more in, in wherever the object is facing, you know, so like for a flower, for, for a living thing, it, it makes sense. It's usually the face, but for a flower, it could be, you know, you, where, where the center of it is, that's the front of the flower and it could face this way, this way, you know, depending on how it's facing. Um, you want more in the future than in the past. Uh, there's something subconscious when we look at a painting and we see that they're sort of walled in at the face and there's a lot of space behind them. It, it feels uncomfortable. Yeah, I would show that. Yeah, so if you look at this one here, um, you know, her face kind of goes pretty close to the edge and then there's all this space behind her. So there's more in her past than in her future. Whereas this feels better because there's a lot in front of her. Her future is wide open. So uh, you wanna be careful about that um, in how you are, um, how you are yeah, positioning your, your figures. So this is a uh, scale. Um, these are very similar, uh, you know, they're, they're both a little bit of a strange painting, of course, but the one on the right here, um, if you notice, all these brush strokes are of a variety of scale. So you have a little brush stroke, a big brush stroke, an even bigger one, um, and and there's a variety of scale. And what that does is, is because there's different scale involved, uh, small, medium, large of something, your eye and overlap, if you think about it, these brush strokes all overlap, mm -hmm. your eye wants to move around. You're, you are um, prone to, to move your eye around because there's something bigger or smaller to look at. Whereas on the left, the scale is virtually the same. Uh, and so you, you it has this oneness to it. It feels like everything is, is all the same. So it has this stagnant look to it where you, your eye does not want to travel. It just sees the whole thing. Um, 
So that scale is an important piece of uh, composition and you always want a variety of scale. So you want your objects, your brush strokes, your everything that you're doing, your line, um, everything to be uh, uh, within uh, a variety of scale. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this again talks about scale. So the painting on the left, um, all those flowers are around the same size. Whereas on the right, we see a lot of variety of scale. Um, and that can be the color zones, that can be the objects themselves. Um, there's groupings of things. It, it just feels um, a lot more dynamic mm -hmm. of, and your eye wants to travel around more. So um, also something that people sometimes struggle with is wanting to make things symmetrical and thinking that that is a good way to do composition. And it really isn't. It's a lot harder to sell things that are, you know, just super symmetrical, having your focal point right in the middle. Um, it usually does not work. So these are some examples of like symmetrical landscapes. Um, so I don't really, I, I don't know the reason why it feels uncomfortable, but it's like, Looking at that, just it was like a division or something. I think because it's, it's contrary to divine proportion. Because mm -hmm. okay. divine proportion is asymmetrical, but within a mathematic, you yeah. know. Okay. We're going to get to that soon. Um, so these landscapes have a very dynamic composition where it's not symmetrical. It's, um, you know, there's a lot, uh, a lot of variety where the trees... There's like one in the foreground, there's some in the background, there's all these different plain fields and, um, and then same with this landscape. So another thing to think about, and this goes for abstracts, landscapes, um, you know, mostly those two things, is having, if you're going to have a horizon line or even a cityscape, um, having that right in the middle is very uncomfortable. And so this painting on the left, I mean, it's not quite the middle, but it's almost there. And it, it just feels like a tangent edgy. edge because it's close to the middle. Yeah. And this line that's not broken up is coming straight across, dividing it in half. So it just, it feels, uh, it just feels uncomfortable looking at that. And then um, this abstract, you know, there's all different kinds. This could be the horizon line up here um, or down here in a way that it's just broken up into a lot of different fields. Um and then um, the, these are all kind of on the busy side, but this painting on the left is so extremely busy, it's very hard to even know what's going on. It took me a while to really see that this was kind of like a, uh, what do you call it, still life tablescape. And all these objects in here are kind of placed evenly apart, and it's and hard nothing to know. anchors it. Yeah, there's no like super dark areas or... The horizon line is hard to tell. These are on the same level. There's no focal point really at all. So um, you're just kind of like your eyes going everywhere, but it can't land on something. Um, and in this one, I think that if some of those vases were off the edges. Yeah, um, and bigger areas. And, and that you had more variety of scale, uh, you know, work. it could work. So it, it, otherwise, it's it's like bad busy it's like too busy and how you know the difference is does your eye just never rest does your eye just keep going round and round and round and round and round and it has this frantic feel that that is um busy and a lot of times you can't tell on your own painting mm -hmm. and you need other people's input uh so um but if you if you're able to look around and then rest and land somewhere uh then then it's good busy yeah and i feel like that painting's really cool almost there but these are just better examples of having a busy painting and uh, still life, but you can still pick something that's kind of the focal point. And it's also really good to have like a triangle in your composition where your eyes kind of led around like the Caravaggio painting in the beginning. So on this painting, um, the eggs in the pan, I think it's because of this dark, it really grounds it. And we look here and then you just kind of like go around in a circle. So that, that works. So resting space is also super important in a composition um, and having the right kind of resting space. Sometimes when you have a lot going on, um, it's easy to sometimes get like this triangle in the corner 
And um, that can happen a lot. I mean, it happens to me all the time. I'll notice, oh no, there's a triangle in the corner and I have to go and fix it. So um, you don't want that to happen where your painting's kind of divided like that. And so to break it up, you can add, um, you know, things going up and down just like and this painting over here. space down at the bottom. Or... Yeah, having it travel through so it's not cut off. Um, so, yeah. Talk about yeah, so I think um, you want your objects or your subjects to be anchored um, and not just kind of floating and suspended. That's going to make us feel uneasy and uh, unsettled. And so uh, the bird there on the left is anchored by, you know, sitting on that line. You can even feel the weight of the bird because uh, the line you know, it, it, it goes up, it changes direction. So you feel the weight. And then this artist uses negative space really nicely at the top where you wonder, you know, so you have the gray sort of as as um, part of the trees and the leaves, but but the gold also. So it's, it's really cool. Um, mm -hmm. And this bird is anchored with very minimal effort. Um, whereas those flowers, I see that there are stems, and yes, they're kind of going to the bottom, but because it's dark on dark, you don't really see the stems yeah. at the bottom. So it gives this illusion like you're suspended. These these um, flowers are suspended, and they're not really anchored anywhere, and so uh, and there's not really overlap, and so it just has a very uneasy feeling. And there's a lot of ways to really anchor your artwork. You can anchor it through color. I always say that... Um, black, white, or a very bright contrast, cra contrasting color like red um, or a bright turquoise or something, if you sort of carry it in and throughout, um, you know, from edge to edge or edge to edge, uh, that will always anchor your subject. Um, and we're going to show you some tricks later on really how to uh, integrate your subject with your background because that is a very common thing that artists struggle with is they do a portrait or they do a figure but they don't know how to incorporate it into the background and they what do I do with my background mm -hmm. and so we're going to show you some tricks on how to deal with background I feel like that floral painting on the left here really does a good job with that where yeah. it's very integrated um so thinking about your canvas edge that's a really this is like a super important rule I think with composition um, if your object's taking up a big space on the canvas, the fact that there's just this little space around, like everything's contained within the edges, it, that feels uncomfortable. You feel so claustrophobic. Having um, having some things touch or go off the edge of the canvas is much better. Um, so I think a lot of like amateur artists, they they don't want their objects somehow. They think it's bad if it's there's a wing cut off or something. And it's actually it's so much better that you do have something going off the canvas. Yeah, some people have a rule um, to anchor your subject on three edges, yeah. um, not four edges, because then you end up with symmetrical and static. Uh, so three edges, you have four edges to your canvas. So if it touches three edges, that isn't something you have to do every single time, no matter what. Um, but it, and if you can see in this piece, um, the three edges, everything but the bottom edge, you know, is is touching. So it is a good rule of thumb that that can help you. So um, cropping an image, and this is also talking about the edges, the horse on the left is kind of cropped in, but I think because it's so abstract and these lines, you know, Anchor go off. It. Yeah, it's it's working. And it's comfortably in there. Yeah, the tail goes off, so that works. Um, and then this horse, it's like there's not enough information for you to really know it's a horse. And it this feels crowded. Yeah, it feels like they're really trying to squish the horse in there. And this um, tangent edge up here really bothers me. Then the legs, like maybe if they showed more of the horse or had its neck going off, then it would work. Mm -hmm. um, so cropping Oof. in on a face. Um, the one on the right here with the nose, this is more uncomfortable. Like the <laughs> nose is just barely touching the edge. So And the mouth. Um, and then if they were to have it cropped even more, I don't know that that would work either. I don't it's know. Just it, it needs too, to be out more. Yeah. So this one works because I think we're really drawn to the lips and the eyes are a little bit more abstract. So as things kind of fade off, you want them to be less noticeable. 
and um, choosing a focal point is really important. Mm -hmm. So um, negative space refers to the space that is between the objects. So if you so if you have your subject, so in both of these cases, the subject is the botanical or the flowers, um, and then there's background. Uh, you a good a good composition is going to have good negative space. So if you were painting a figure and the figure is all closed like this, and there's really no negative space, it's not going to be as good as you know, if if there's some negative space in there, right? Um, so it's the same thing with any subject, whether it's a horse. In fact, the previous slide with the horses, one had very good negative space and the other one didn't. Yeah, that's um, a good point, yeah. And so when w in these flowers, the, the painting on the left, there's a lot of negative space in there. And so the artist is using the background as a tool to highlight the foreground through negative space, whereas on the right, it's these dense clumps of flowers um, that that those flowers really don't have uh, negative space. So you, it feels heavy, it feels um, too dense. You don't feel like you can breathe. You feel, again, that sort of claustrophobic, caged in feeling. And um, composition, you know, I, I think by now you're getting is, is something you feel. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, it's even on a subconscious level where you just look at art and go, mm, mm, no, mm -mm. but you don't know why. Um, whereas you look at another one and you, oh, yeah, I like that. Um, and because it's something that you feel. And um, people want to feel expansive. They want to feel depth. They want to feel safe. They want to feel, um, you know, anchored. They want to feel supported. Th that's how you want people to feel throughout the composition. Um, but if you're feeling sort of unbalanced, unhinged, suspended, static, heavy, claustrophobic, squished, right, you, you, you're you going to not like the painting. Um, so these are some tips and tools for you guys um, to create a really good composition. So we're going to go through the rule of thirds, divine proportion, chiaroscuro, and then um, having like three unequal parts for like an abstract. So um, if you divide your painting in thirds um, using a grid like this, then the four, the these points here where everything intersects, those are the best spots for a uh, focal point in your painting. And I think this is, you know, talking about photography maybe, but the same rules apply to art. And I just thought this was interesting that people, 41% of viewers look in this top left first. So that's, that to me sounds like that's the most comfortable spot. People just innately look there when they're going to look at something. Um, and maybe that has to do with being like right-handed, looking from left to right, reading left to right. I don't know. Um, but everyone's different and any of those four spots are, are really good spots for a focal point. Okay. So, um, divine proportion, um, you, this is, this is very interesting. I remember when I first discovered this, I was just blown away and I, I just thought, oh my gosh, this is, this is amazing. You know, there's, 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 um, you know, and, and it's aptly named divine proportion. It's like, this isn't coincidental. This isn't just a freak of nature. This is, this is design. This is, um, so beautiful and amazing. And, uh, basically what it is, is all things that are in nature that are naturally created, um, are going to have a one to 1.6, uh, ratio. Um, well, to be exact, it's 1.618. So, um, so a one to 1.6. So, if you if you look at your hand, everything on your body is that ratio. So, your first knuckle to your second knuckle is one to 1.6. Um, your you know your finger to your hand to your to your arm is 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 or this to this is 1.6. Yeah. Um, this to this is 1.6. Um, so it. No matter how you look at the body or anything that was created, even our teeth are, are in that ratio. Um, bugs, birds, all living things really are have that proportion in them. Uh, our legs are that way. Our whole face is that way. Um, so we are 
uh, we have this um, sort of, um, I don't know, how would you describe it? We're, we're sort of inclined to see it. We mm -hmm. see it everywhere. And so it feels really comfortable to us. When you look at somebody in the face, you're seeing divine proportion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All day as you look at your hands, you're seeing divine proportion. Uh, anything that you look at, it has these mathematics in it. In nature. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So when you see something created by an artist in a composition and it disrupts this, uh, this ratio, uh, you, you, you feel it and it feels bad. Most of us or many of us can just instinctually nail it. You just instinctually create one to 1 1.6 because we see it all the time and it's sort of ingrained in us to see. So it comes out of us very easily. It's sort of within us, we have divine proportion within, within our creative power. We, we exude divine proportion as we, as we create. So it's really, really fascinating. Um, the old masters, many of them actually measured, they knew about this, even mm -hmm. the ancient Greeks, uh, when they created the Acropolis, uh, they wanted it with divine proportion, no matter how you looked at it, what, no matter what angle it has those proportions. And they went through great lengths in measuring while they created it. Uh, so they've known about divine proportion since ancient times. And so the old masters knew this and they would um, try and, and uh, mm. create their, their pieces to fit uh, divine proportion. This, this painting is very interesting. Is that birth of Venus? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Botticelli. So, um, and composition can be learned and you can get your ruler out and you can start measuring just like, you know, some of the old masters did. Um, and as you create, um, as you create divine proportion, I, I think it actually, uh, calibrates us. It sort of, um, like is like a tuning fork, um, to, to our insides and it, it draws us into this almost like place of healing. And, and they've done a lot of studies on this, how art heals and, um, you know, Da Vinci even, you know, talked a lot about it. So, uh, divine proportion, proportion as a tool can actually, um, really heal us. And the interesting thing that this is just something, I don't know that you'll hear really anywhere else. And it is definitely my opinion. Um, so you are powerful to disagree. You do not have to agree with this. So this is just my opinion, but I have found in my experience working with artists that, um, artists that have undergone a lot of trauma in their life and things that have sort of, um, fragmented their soul in a way, uh, have a very difficult time, um, uh, producing that divine proportion or, mm. or creating, um, uh, settling compositions. And it might be that, that, that sort of disruption inside them is, is coming out in their art. Mm -hmm. And so, and so the compositions that they make, um, tend to have that, um, uh, feels more disruptive, feel, feel disrupted and unbalanced. So an example of this is, uh, my husband, John, um, you know, he, he had some traumatic things in his childhood and, uh, and had a lot of, a lot of things he wasn't in control of. Um, and so that sort of desire for safety, balance, and control, his default is to create perfect symmetry. And if he isn't careful, if he isn't watchful of it, he wants his focal point smack dab in the middle and something vertical here and something vertical here. So his perfect composition would be a vertical line here and a vertical line there, like a goal, a goal post with something smack dab in the middle. Um, and that it, now when he's done producing it, he might look at it and go, oh, that's a bad composition. Why did I do that? But if he just goes into default and he doesn't edit as he goes, that is what he wants to produce. So um, it's really, really interesting how the composition inside of us is really an expression of, of our soul in a lot of ways, good, bad, or otherwise. And, um, and it's also to me fascinating how creating art with a pleasing composition, like I said, it's like a tuning fork and it, it, it brings healing. It brings a subtle, a, a feeling of anchor being anchored and, and whole and fulfillment to, to, to our soul as we paint. And so, um, it's really, it's, it's really an interesting thing. Composition is, is, 
um, comes from within, but you also can manipulate it, let's say, from the outside with knowledge and knowing what is pleasing composition and not. So um, uh, another trick um, that you can use, another tool is uh, what the old masters call chiaroscuro. And all that really means is light against dark and dark against light. Um, this slide is kind of showing up a little bit dark, but the, if you can see the contrast, hopefully it's showing up on this on the camera. But um, the contrast back here is lighter than the hair. So is it showing up where you can see that this is lighter? Okay, so this is lighter and this is darker. So her dark side is up against the light, and her light side. Do you see how her hair is lit here? Is up against the dark. Um, and so what that does when you have the figure their light side against a dark background and then their dark, the dark part of the figure or the shadow part of the figure up against the light background, it holds the figure. It's, it's a way to integrate your subject into your background. Mm -hmm. um, now on a more abstract level here with this floral, you can see on um, uh, the, it's more of a top bottom thing. So here you have the dark, dark vase against the light background and they chose to put the shadow behind and not here, right? So uh, you have dark against light. So this, this tablecloth is the light and then the vase is the dark. Then you have the light flowers up against a darker background. Mm -hmm. uh, you have the light flowers and here the shadow up against the darker background, the dark shadow up against the light background. So this contrast of light against dark, this chiaroscuro really creates a really fantastic composition, not to mention all the lines, the divine proportion that's in here. Um, so there's a lot of things to this floral that, that make it um, have yeah. a nice composition. And a lot of times if people just, you know, struggle with the background and don't know how to, to integrate their subject with the background, this is a really great tool for that because if you just don't know what to do, then you can always play with the light and dark and that always helps. Right. Oops. Oops. Okay. So the last trick we want to teach you, um, for, uh, composition or how to integrate your subject with your background um, this is, of course, an abstract, but let's just say this white um, figure here, um, this white figure is the subject. What you can do to integrate your subject with the background is uh, cut, your, your comp cut your canvas into three unequal parts. So if you look here at the blue line that was added later, uh, that divides the canvas into three unequal parts, and then you just simply put your subject you know, between the lines of those parts where those mm -hmm. parts intersect. Yeah. Um, so that's how this was done to create a composition. So this is a great trick for abstract mm -hmm. painting. This is a great trick for um, anything that's sort of more abstracted is wherever you want your focal point or your subject, um, that from that point, three unequal parts. So now we wanna share with you um, some of our personal art that so this is some paintings that actually sold pretty quickly and um it could be for a variety of reasons there's always so many reasons why someone buys a painting but one strong reason is the composition worked um and then so okay this painting you know there's a lot of overlap there's the flowers kind of transitioning the through line it meanders yeah the dark um, the dark anchors us in there's a focal point here, but then your eye goes here and then it just kind of like goes around. Um, There's this, a lot of chiaroscuro, like with, yeah. the, with the ears. Yeah. Um, this painting in the middle, I feel like it's an interesting composition choice. Um, I, I feel like at times as an artist, you kind of want to break the rules a little bit and it's okay to do that. Um, you can always, like sometimes I try things and it just doesn't work, um, but... I, when I do a lot of portraits, um, it's kind of hard to not have the portrait in the middle of the canvas because if it's taking up a lot of the space, it's going to be in the middle. So that's kind of what's happening here. But I had these um, cherry blossoms kind of going in that third of the painting and then the, the poppies over here in another, th in another third. Um, same with the horizon line right here. So using the rule of thirds, you can still um, kind of ground the painting and then 
play off of some things and it's okay to break the rules a little bit. Um, and then here's some art that all these pieces still sold, but they took a little bit longer. Um, I think because of interesting compositions with this one, this was definitely a more experimental piece where I was trying something weird, maybe, <laughs> um, with the lion being right in the middle. That's, you know, typically something uncomfortable that we just said, don't do that. But, um, because it's in the background, I thought maybe that's just like something you kind of notice later, but you first look here with the fate with her face and then you look at the line and then there's like this triangle happening. So you're, you are kind of going around with your eye. Um, but this piece still took a little bit of time. Um, it took longer to sell. So same with this, um, floral piece on the left. And I think there's a lot of tangent edges in here. Um, it is weird looking, picking apart your own piece of art, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe you should have done this for me and I should have done it for you. But anyway, that's true. Um, okay. You can okay. do mine. <laughs> So same with this bird over here. This one. Um, I can talk about that one. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, that that did sell. Um, but there's, there, and the good thing is, is you faded the, the um, you know, you have this bird almost landing on this this woman's face. Like and it's so, going to peck her or something. Yeah, <laughs> but but it was faded. And, and I think it is kind of up to interpretation. But I do think that the bird being placed where it was um, people either loved that or they didn't like it. Um, and it's, so it's one of those rules that you break, um, that to say something, to say something. And so, um, that, that could go either way. And so that's probably why it did take longer to sell, but it doesn't mean that, um, the composition's bad necessarily. Right. I think it has an interesting composition, but it takes the right person to like appreciate it. Yeah. Um, so these, these are pieces that um, sold pretty quickly or at least as soon as they were seen. Sometimes, you know, I'll paint something, but it hasn't, hasn't been seen much. Um, but if it's seen just, and then as soon as it's seen, it sells. Um, I know, it, you know, probably uh, um, besides just the subject matter or how it was painted, um, the composition is not going to be a bad one. It's, 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 a, mm -hmm. it's a good composition. So... Um, each of these sold uh, relatively quickly. The the painting on the right with um, the fish didn't. The original didn't sell uh, too quickly, but it's my best selling print of all time. So I think that 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 is, um, you know, it, it has this composition where you sort of zigzag throughout it. Yeah, there's like a snake thing. So that is another uh, good composition. Is having just having your eye go around as much as possible. It's mm -hmm. really really good thing. Um, now these pieces have been shown a lot and haven't sold. Well, the angel hasn't been shown a lot, but the other two have, and um, and they haven't sold. And I think the one on the left um, with the two unicorns um, is is just too symmetrical. You have two objects on the same plane. Uh, one is not in front of the other. Uh, there's there's really no overlap, and they're both looking in the same direction. So your eye wants to go off the canvas. Um, and so, you know, if I were doing that over, I'd probably would have flipped one of them. So it did this and, um, you know, it's still a great painting. And I feel like <laughs> the stars here, um, between them kind of unite them together where it doesn't feel so uncomfortable in that mm -hmm. space. Um, none of these paintings to me feel uncomfortable, but I can see that maybe like, especially with the um, flamingo having those two like triangular dark areas. If you maybe added some flowers or something and then it would mm -hmm. break it up. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, and then the angel, you know, has more in her past than the future. So, and it, it's kind of crowded as it, as it goes in there. So, um, so this is my best guess. And the thing to remember is, you know, when it is your own work, um, it is hard. It, it's difficult to, um, to see these things to yourself. See these things yourself. So I think it's always great to be in a community of artists where you can get feedback from other artists. You can get feedback from other people um, that are looking at your work and can give you some honest advice so that you can fix these things or tweak some things. Sometimes just lightening something so it's not so noticeable. Um, even if you have something kind of close to the edge. 
uh, and you're like, oh no, I can't change that. It's close to the edge. It's so hard to fix. Uh, I'd have to repaint the whole thing. Sometimes if you just fade it, like n once you're aware of it, you just don't make it so noticeable. It's something you notice later. And maybe it'll never be your best composition, but it's passable. It's good enough. And mm -hmm. those places that it's kind of like, um, you know, when you write something and, and you go back through and you reread it, there's sticky points where the word choice is off, you know, the sentence doesn't flow right, and you have to edit it and smooth it out. It's the same thing with painting. Um, I don't know if, you know, composition is one of those things that you have 100% right or you've bombed it. It's not, it's not that black and white. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of gray in there that just like with a piece of writing, you can edit and go back through and the parts that are sort of sticking out or making you feel uncomfortable or those sticky parts, you can tweak them by changing the color. Uh, if something's really noticeable and you don't want it to be, remember you're the director of the movie, you can downplay it and you can make that sit back more. And maybe you wanna bring up this area over here uh, and you want the eye to go there, then you can add something or you can you know, create more contrast. So. Composition is something you can play with uh, if, if it isn't 100% going your way. Uh, if your focal point's right in the middle, change it. Make something else the focal point. Um, like Dimitra said with her, with her lion, uh, by fading that lion back and bringing the, the woman uh, more brighter and having that sort of um, lead in where you go right to, to her face you know, is, is a way to offset a yeah. lion right in the middle. Yeah. Um, but the cool thing is everyone has their own unique composition and the more that you paint and the more consistently you paint and you start to have like a big body of work, you can start to see the patterns and we all have, um, like you said earlier with the golden ratio, we all know what feels right. And so when you get in tune with that, um, it'll, you can start to express yourself in really, um, you know, beautiful ways. So I've noticed with a lot of my paintings, um, I, I do paint a lot of different subjects, but like my most, most painted subjects, I'll do like a woman facing an animal. And so it always creates this like heart shape composition. And that's something that is repeated over and over my work. So I start to understand like, there's like even deeper symbolism with that. Like, why is it a heart? And it's you like this connection. Right so yeah. And it's kind of like this triangle shape where it, it is kind of a heart. So um, that's just something that you'll see after you paint for a long period of time. You'll start to see that in your work. Mm -hmm. And so really learning the right skills and getting confidence in yourself and learning all these techniques. There's so many different ways to approach composition and how to maybe take a painting that has bad composition and then making it work. Um yeah, it just, it all gets easier once you, you have the skill set. Yeah. I, I can't emphasize enough how important skills are and really um, painting a lot, just mm -hmm. getting over the fears, getting past um, those frustrations. Um, when you're first learning something or if your skills aren't, you know, really solid, then you're all, you're kind of always questioning something. Is the proportion right? Does it look right? Oh, it's not it's not looking how I wanted. I wanted it to be more like this, but now you know it's turning out more like that. And not really knowing when it's finished or knowing how to resolve you know a piece. All those questions, all that doubt, is solved by learning the skills and um, and and really the act of painting. Um, and a lot of people think that it takes years and years and years to get these skills. And it really doesn't. I mean, Dimitra picked up these skills. Um, she started painting at age 12. Um, it wasn't like she painted her whole life and was in art classes since birth. I mean, she really didn't paint until she was 12 years old. She did drawing, she doodled, she was creative, but she didn't paint until she was 12. And by the time she was 15, she, she was selling in galleries and selling a lot of artwork. So that's only three years. And, and it's not because... Um, you know, she had, you know, an incredible amount of talent. Um, I know that's what we want to believe. We want to believe, well, wow, both her parents were artists and she had all this talent, but I saw the progression. I saw what her first paintings were like. I saw what, um, you know, she really, uh, made before she learned the skills and it wasn't that good. 
uh, it, she, she had to learn these things. I had to learn these things. I mean, my first paintings were just terrible. I feel like for the first 10 years, my paintings were terrible, even though I was selling them, they were just, you know, not, and not an, that great. As an artist, you're always evolving. You can always get better. Um, there's never a point where that you just are like, you've arrived and that's it. You can always continue to learn and grow and evolve your style. So we're still evolving. Yeah. And we're, we're always learning. So, um, we, uh, we just want to highlight how the mastery program can really solve almost anything that you want, um, as an artist, if it's skills that you want, uh, the mastery program really is the answer, uh, because it's the fast track to getting those skills. The, the rate at which our students learn the skills is, is absolutely revolutionary because it's so immersive and the way that the mastery program is laid out and how uh, each, each lesson um, sort of builds into the next. It's, it's incredible. Um, and, you know, the other thing is, is, you know, finding your voice and your style is another thing that artists really struggle with. And the mastery program helps you with that. Um, and, of course, marketing and selling your artwork, that is a big one. That is in my opinion, in fact, when I first uh, opened the Milan Art Institute, I was thinking, you know, I want to solve one of the greatest problems artists have. That was that was really what was on my heart when I opened Milan Art Institute. Is this is one of the biggest problems in in you know in uh, for artists that I can think of how they can consistently sell their artwork, how they can have predictable success that doesn't depend on luck, that doesn't depend on talent, that doesn't depend on knowing the right people. Just how can you at will, fully empowered in yourself, how can I decide, make a decision and act on that decision and therefore be successful? What tools does an artist need? And that is why I created the mastery program so that you can just simply do the work all that's required from you is doing the work. If you do the work and you and you commit to the work, you will be successful. And so that's why I created it. Um, and there's a lot of ways to learn out there. There really is. Um, there's um, uh, there's um, I don't know where where what, there's a slide that I'm trying to find, but um, there's you know ways that you can learn online with um, with YouTube. Right. But it's not curated. There's no way to really have it all build to something. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I'm going to learn how to watercolor a flower today. OK, so tomorrow I'm going to learn how to draw in charcoal, you know, a, a figure. OK, now I'm going to learn this. And it's it's just all over the place and it never builds into an actual skill set. Yeah. It's just sort of a random a random thing. So, um, you know, there's there's online um, schools out there, but. But having a curriculum and a program that has this end result of getting you in position to actually be a professional artist, I think is just really key. And I haven't seen anything out there quite like this. Uh, so, um, you know, and of course there's art schools out there, right? Um, traditional art schools. I went to traditional art school and uh, I went to Savannah College of Art and Design and that costs from what I understand like 50, 60,000 a year right now. and. They didn't teach me how to have a career as an artist. In fact, the professors told me you couldn't have a career as a fine artist. It was very rare. And just be content with doing art for art's sake uh, and, you know, be okay with, you know, being a barista or a, a waitress or, or whatever else to pay the bills. And I didn't like that. I didn't, I didn't want to accept that. Um, I believed that art is powerful. Art is important. Art is something that enriches the world and people want. So why can't I create that art and sell it and be able to make a living? And so uh, that's what I set out to do. Uh, and, you know, there's also like local schools, um, you know, that, that have in, in town, but it depends on where you live. Um, you have to go at a specific time. You have to, you know, and they're kind of hit or miss. It just depends on who's teaching it. Some are good, some aren't good. And again, does it actually build into the objective, the goal of, of having a career as an artist? So all these things are what we thought about when we put this together and when we created the mastery mm -hmm. program. We wanted people to be able to uh, take the program at their on their own schedule, on their own time, if they wanted to go super fast and and do it 
full-time, immersively hardcore, they could finish in five or six months. If they wanted to do it maybe 20 hours a week um, on a part-time basis, it could take them a year. If they wanted to go longer and maybe 10 hours a week uh, and not be able to devote that much time to it, maybe it would take two years. But the, the key is you're doing it on your time when you are able, when it fits in with uh, your life and your schedule. Yeah. Um, I didn't want people to have to like show up and be, you know, uh, bound by geography. Uh, we have students from South Africa, from uh, from all over Europe, Eastern Europe, from Canada, from um, South America, all over the world, um, taking this program. Because if you can access online, uh, if you can get on the web, then you can take this this course. Um, and I didn't want people to be. Um, excluded, uh, you know, based on on finances. Um, you know, Savannah College of Art and Design is an extremely exclusive school. You have to be loaded to be able to go to that school. I mean, who has sixty thousand dollars a year to go to art school? Um, whereas the mastery program is extremely affordable. I mean, you can go to the, take the mastery program for as low as three hundred dollars a month for only twelve months. So it's it's um, you know it's very very affordable. Yeah. So just to give you um, the four parts of the program, we've divided it into four parts. Also, everything that is in the master program was um, filmed by us and created by us as professional artists. So we are teaching you from our personal experience. It's not just something that's whatever, fluffy and just like what you should know. It's what we've actually gone through and what we've found has worked. Yeah. And the whole design of it is to help you guys find your own style within that because um, that's going to leave you the most fulfilled. And every artist to be successful has to have a consistent, cohesive style. And you don't want paintings that are all over the place. Um, that's not going to work in galleries or promoting yourself. You have to have a consistency. So that's the whole point of the mastery program is to really expose you to all these techniques and then help you find and hone in on what you really love and become a, a master of your own style. So part one is just um, really the foundations, learning how to draw an oil paint. So we start out with the hardest things and you get through that and you feel really confident. And then part and you see two, your sc skills just skyrocket. It's yeah. amazing. And people sell their work all along the way, which is really amazing. Um, it happens all the time. I don't even know one student that hasn't sold anything. Um, so everything that you're doing for your assignments, you can sell that and just say, you know, it's studies, you're, you're in this program and, um, you can sell your work. So, um, part two is all mixed media. We teach you all sorts of fun techniques, um, really just so many different things. And it's all to help you kind of find what you love. Um, and then you also explore voice in part two. So discovering things about yourself and how it relates to your art. And that, I mean, just that in itself is probably like one of the most valuable things of the whole Absolutely. program. So part three is like taking all that, creating a portfolio, putting it all together um, and building professional habits as an artist. So learning how to paint and stay in the studio for long periods of time, how to organize your studio, how to really be efficient and productive. And then part four is... Um, learning how to brand yourself. So we really teach um, everything that we've done as artists from uh, traditional ways to more modern ways. And we're also just adding to this. So anytime that we feel like there needs to be an update and we've learned some new things, we're adding it to the program mm -hmm. and you guys get access to that. Because you have lifetime access. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, part four is putting it all together and then starting to we uh, help you sell your work. So um, here's some student feedback. Yeah, so, so Autumn says um, that she sold over $10,000 worth of art since she started the program. Um, and so, and she hasn't even really focused on promotion. So like Demetra said, uh, happens with so many students. They're excited about their journey. They're, they're seeing how much they're growing. They're seeing um, what they're able to accomplish and it's, it's exciting to them. And so they share it online and their friends begin to notice and their family notices and their friends' friends notice. And, um, and you know, they, they get new followers because they're, they're posting about what they're doing and uh, they end up actually 
selling their artwork, even the assignments that mm -hmm. they're doing that isn't even their portfolio. Um, maybe they paint an animal in mixed media and somebody's like, whoa, I've, I love that zebra. I want to buy it. Um, and so it happens all the time. And we yeah. hear just tons and tons of testimonials about that. Um, so that, was, that was long. Yeah, yeah, I didn't read the whole thing. So this is a brilliant class on a huge variety of styles of drawing and painting. It has stretched my world of what's familiar in the art world, and I'm delighted with some of the pieces I've done. Um, you said, and my pieces are getting attention from people who are wanting to buy them, and I only just started recently. So it's super exciting that people sell their paintings all along the way. And this is probably the best compliment you could ever get. Deciding to enroll in the master program was literally the best decision of my life. Um, not only myself, but everyone around me has noticed an enormous improvement in my art. So that's really amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm only in week three of the program and has already changed my life. So she's already learned so much. Her skills are flying through the roof. And I'm constantly surprised by what comes out of my hands. I think the reason we hear so many times that this program has changed people's life is basically what this person is saying. My confidence in myself as, as an artist has grown tremendous, tremendously. If you have confidence and you, and you see yourself confidently pursuing your own dream, this dream that's been so precious and has lived with you your whole life, this dream of being an artist full time and being able to share what you create with the world and you actually see yourself stepping into your destiny, walking that out, and, and living it out and you see the successes and you see how you've grown and you've learned, it is, it is transformative. It is life changing. It is absolutely life changing um, because there's no greater feeling. There's no uh, more fulfilling thing than knowing that you're living out your purpose and you're doing what you're passionate about and what you love to do most. And that's what this program gives people. And that is why it is life changing. Mm -hmm. um, this, this is a graduate, um, uh, Tanya Boo. In fact, she was just here filming with us and, and had shared how she worked at a grocery store and she was, she was, you know, kind of dibble dabbled in art. She was passionate about art, but she really couldn't figure out how to put it all together. Um, and like everybody else would watch some YouTube videos and, you know, attend, a, you know, a, a class every once in a while, but she just really, it never went anywhere. And she thought, you know, I'll probably just always work in this grocery store and, you know, maybe one day I'll be a, a manager. And, uh, and she took the program, she sold her work throughout the program, her assignments, she started her portfolio, she started selling her artwork, um, her portfolio before she even graduated, she got into a gallery. Um, then as soon as she graduated, uh, within just, uh, I think it was like a month of graduation, she was able to match her income, exceed her income that she had at the grocery store, and she became a full-time artist. And now she you yeah. know, does a lot better than she did in, in the grocery store financially. And she is a full-time artist uh, selling her work all over. And it's, that, that is life-changing you know, for anyone. So um, also with Tanya, I remember seeing her style in the beginning. It was so different. Like what you're seeing now, this is a very cohesive, strong look. And this is what she's known for. It's easily recognizable. But before it was super different than this. And then she started really applying herself, painting, putting all the um, like dedicated hours into her work and found the style. So it's just really cool to see so many different varieties of styles and um, everyone has their own voice and um, yeah, it's just really cool. So we want to answer your questions. Um, uh, I want to go through just a couple things here before we get to that, but get, get your questions ready. Um, maybe uh, Jake, you already have some questions for us. Um, I just want to highlight some of the uh, benefits of the mastery program besides this incredible course. Um, so with that, with the, the cost of the tuition, um, which is $3,600, um, you have lifetime access. So you always have access to this program. Uh, that's, that's just $3,600. And with that, there is 100 plus uh, bonus lessons. So that is additional lessons, um, things that are very specific, like how to paint clouds, 
how to paint eyelashes, you know, just very nitty gritty, very specific things um, that you have access to. We also have a pro library, which has very high quality courses um, that support everything in the mastery program. So, uh, you know, once you've graduated or you've gone through a section of the program, you can take one of these courses. Um, you have a lifetime access to it. And then this is very exciting. We just launched this this month and I am so excited about this. Uh, we have every single month uh, monthly contests um, for mastery students where where the prize money, the, the purse of, of the prize money is, is $10,000. So we have five contests that go on. There's one for each section. Uh, so no matter where you are in the mastery program, whether you just started or you're in the middle of it or you're finishing it, you can participate in these contests every single month. And you're not creating brand new artwork for the contest to you know, kind of get you off track from, from learning. You are submitting your lessons. So your assignments you submit as into the contest um, and you have a chance to win um, you know, $500 in art supplies plus $500 in cash, or there's other prizes where it's $1,000, $2,000, or even $3,000. Um, as a graduate of the program, um, the, gr the grand prize is $3,000 plus the opportunity to show one of your pieces in our gallery. We have a physical gallery here in Sarasota, Florida, um, where collectors come in all the time. Dimitra and I have our work in this, and you have a chance to have your artwork right next to our artwork in this gallery, plus win $3,000. So really, really, really exciting. incredible <laughs> opportunities that really you have for life. Like you can have access to these opportunities month after month after month after month, uh, as yeah. long as you want. So I don't know any other program out there that offers something like that. Um, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, also, uh, as, as a student, um, coaching is included. So you um, are put into an exclusive group with a cohort of, of students that are right there with you. Um, they're going through the exact same things that you're going through. And, um, and then there are professional artists that have all gone through the mastery program and they are there coaching you along. Uh, there's weekly Zoom calls that you can attend and have live face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, you can get critiques of your assignments and your artwork and know exactly where you stand, what you need to do to improve, and what you're doing right um, and you need to keep doing. So really, really valuable to have that community, um, to have um, to have all those uh, um, all that support right mm -hmm. there with you. Yeah, so that's with the essentials. Um, everything we just mentioned, that is the base level. This is 3,600 um, or the, oh, sorry. Well, that should have been slashed. <laughs> that's confusing. Yeah, Okay. something's wrong with this slide. It's actually, we want to clarify, it says 300 a month. It's 330 a month. Or if you pay in full, you save $360. And you can tell the math is off here. Uh, it's 3,600. So we need to fix that slide. Okay. And yeah. Yeah. But you get all that for this option. Then um, this is the accelerator. So this is a everything that we just mentioned plus a year of personal mentoring with a, uh, a mentor that you can text anytime and you get um, monthly one on one calls just with your mentor, um, not as a group, but you also have access to the group one too. So this is just really the best um, option if you're looking for that one-on-one -on -one because it really does help having someone to critique like when you need it while you're painting and um, getting that feedback really quickly. So this is just um, probably our most popular choice. Um, and then right now it's sold out uh, we don't have room for more students, but maybe in the near future, um, you can do all this with uh, either me or my mom as your mentor. So that is, um, oh, okay. That is all the information about the mastery program. And it's really our, just our passion, like everything mm. that we um, have experienced as professionals, we just want to help other artists. And so, um, we just cover really everything that we know as artists. And so mm -hmm. it's just a really, really good course. And you can join the wait list because registration is not open right now, but it opens on the first of every month. 
So we have people kind of joining in groups. So you get to know, um, you know, other students. You're going with those students at the same time. Um, so you can pre-register, but you have to get on the waiting list. And Jake, is there lots of questions or, um, I don't know, comments from people? Yeah, there are a few questions. Um, so there were some questions earlier um, about composition. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's see. Okay, uh, Kinga wanted to know, what are your suggestions on composing a single face portrait? Any advice to make it dynamic and not boring? That's a really good question. I feel like um, <clears throat> it really depends on the techniques that you're going about painting your portrait because if you're using mixed media techniques and you're using, I don't know, big brushes, spray paint, something like that, then you can have a dynamic background integrated with your mm -hmm. portrait. So parts of the skin are maybe integrated with the background and you have like this coming and going effect. So there's so many different ways to approach that, but I think it's all in the way that you're painting. Um, if you just have a straight up portrait that's like really realistic or I don't know, it's watercolor or something, you, you'd you want to work on the background at the same time and try to integrate the colors so that I, I think th the only mistake that you could do is like just really keeping them separate and not um, also just having a plain portrait is harder to sell. So having, you have to mix it up and have it like really interesting in like the way that you're putting down paint or the colors that you're choosing because just plain mm -hmm. realistic portraits are, are harder to sell. So I think it's all about the edges. You want the edges as it moves back to fade in and out of the background, either through abstraction. You could also utilize chiaroscuro. You could use, cut up your background into three unequal parts. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways to integrate the, um, the portrait, but I think not having perfect defined edges around the head is going to be uh, important. Okay. Um, so Janice wanted to know how many hours per week do you suggest for the mastery program um, in parts two to four? And maybe just, you could say, throughout the whole program. Yeah. So in order to um, finish the program in one year, and this includes breaks built in, uh, you need to spend 20 hours a week uh, painting. So when it comes to your portfolio, you're, you're supposed to paint two paintings per week. Um, and, and now there are breaks so that you can catch up during those breaks. You can, um, you know, uh, it, it, most students are able to do that. So two paintings per week, um, gives you about 10 hours or so on each painting. Uh, if you if you spend more time than that on your artwork, like some artists, uh, you know, they spend more like 15 or 20 hours on each painting, um, then you maybe could only get like one and a half finished each week. Um, and but because there's so many weeks in the portfolio section, you will able you'll be able to hit your 25 uh, very easily. So. Uh, I would say a good general rule of thumb is 20 hours a week, maybe towards the end as you're, as you're moving more into your business, you're going to want to spend more time. I know by that time people get really, really committed. Uh, they've already either lessened their hours at work, um, because they're already selling their art, uh, or they've already made that transition and then they work, uh, you know, full time on their painting. Other people aren't able to do that and they still work at it 20 hours a week. Uh, so it's it's really up to you. Okay. Um, mm, sorry, I was answering a question. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mad Nat had a question. Uh, could it be some people use negative composition to get a negative feeling? Mm. Like there's a reason they're breaking compositional rules, basically. Yeah, I think people do that um, on purpose, but I think our approach in like teaching this workshop is more geared towards creating like, like we think it's better to make a pleasing composition so that you can sell it better and it'll appeal to more people because if people are going to want to live with it in their home, people don't buy uncomfortable, dark feeling art. 
um, that's, you know, making you feel edgy every time you look at it. So that's, that's just from our experience, like that type of art is a lot harder to live with and people don't tend to really collect that. So, um, but yeah, people can do that on purpose. Um, Dakota wanted to know, does the program include the legalization of your business and steps to take, uh, to make sure you're following the law and are a legitimate business? Um, so the answer to that is no. And the reason is, is we have students from all over the world and every country is different. Um, and so I think those are very, very easy to look up and very easy to follow. Mm -hmm. um, what we recommend is that you find a CPA or a lawyer or it depends some, some, you know, here in the United States, there's some states where you're just basically an artist, sole proprietor, there's no license, there's no legalities whatsoever. You file your taxes as an entrepreneur, a sole proprietor, and it's no big deal. I know we have some students in the Netherlands where they have to file things with their government just to get a website um, going. So uh, I, from what I understand, because we have students that do it all over the world, it's not difficult. Um, the best thing is to find students in the program, uh, which you will find, uh, who live near you, that, that live in the country uh, um, where you are, that are further ahead and have already done that and ask them those questions. Um, there's no way for us to be accurate or we don't even want that responsibility, you know, to, to advise people on legal issues regarding their business on the multitude of countries that, that yeah. you know, represent the students. Um, okay, uh, Debbie wanted to know, could you talk more about cropping and what is good and what to avoid in terms of cropping with composition? Uh-huh. What I learned working with publishers um, and licensing um, all those years is generally what sells better is not cropping, um, avoiding too much cropping. Now, there's a lot of cases uh, where creatively speaking, extreme cropping is, is good. Like we looked at some of those portraits um, where that one portrait, what made the piece is that it was cropped. Uh, if it was just a standard you know, head, uh, you know, it wouldn't be as exciting of a piece. So obviously what I'm saying has, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, breaking the rules is, is certainly good, but generally cropping a lot, I think, um, typically isn't as good as, as keeping, keeping the whole subject in there. But yes, there are lots of rules about it. So cropping right at the neck here is, is not a great idea. You want to include the shoulder so it doesn't look like a chopped head. Um, you know, cropping at the wrist, you know, if the arm's going off is not a good idea. So you just think of wherever you crop, you're cutting. So if it's an uncomfortable place to cut, they say for the, the torso, you know, you crop here, um, you crop, you know, at the, at the thighs, um, you can crop at the, at the waist here. There's, there's various places, um, that make sense. You wouldn't want to crop at the knees or the ankles, um, or, or, you know, at the hips, you, you, the, you, it's a, it's sort of um, somewhat intuitive. Huh. I wonder if that's uh, having to do with bones or something. Yeah, I think so. Because subconsciously, you're like, I don't want my I, head chopped off. Yeah, or like here it's soft. So anyway, I'm thinking abstractly. <laughs> yeah, and then I think for animals, it's the same way. Like on a horse, you wouldn't crop right where it's like the tangent edge idea, right where the neck meets the shoulders, it would be midway up. You don't want to crop right at the jaw. You know, it's probably the 1, 1.1 to 1. 1.6 ratio ratio when you're cropping things. That's probably what it is. Like with torso and everything, there's different ratios that work. Yeah, so. maybe. So I think it's something that you have to kind of feel and think through. Um, and I do think that there, for almost any subject matter, there, there are sort of rules about that cropping. Um, and I would, whenever you crop, you don't want it to be noticeable. That, that is, that's the main thing. So you fade at the edges. Uh, it, it's, it's, there's no like harsh lines where you go, oh, it got chopped off right there. It's something you, you barely want to notice. Um, Kathleen wants to know, how would you place figures that are connected so they are not placed in the center of the composition? Hmm. That's kind of like a more open-ended. Yeah, question. it's a little bit hard to visualize. Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure a hundred percent. I think keeping in account everything we talked about, but like having good negative space between the figures, 
um, having them maybe touch three sides of the canvas, keeping the rule of thirds. And really, if you just stick to like the good focal point areas, those four quadrants, you can't really go wrong. Um, yeah, that'd be my advice. Jeanette wants to know, is Pixelmator and or sub, uh, other similar apps used for source making taught in the mastery program? Yes, mm -hmm. we do go in depth on um, both our techniques on how to create sources and what we use. And we do use Pixelmator and we show you um, kind of like the screen recording of us using it. Yeah, we show you step by step how to use Pixelmator um, and all kinds of other ways to create sources besides that, because not yeah. every artist wants to, wants to use Pixelmator. Um, and and so there's a lot of ways to create sources. And so we teach you all those. There's a whole section called on source making uh, in the mastery program. There are several people asking about how you find inspiration and sources. Mm, that's good. Um, I think it's different. How you find it, how I find it, is fairly different. Yeah. Um, it's like how we find inspiration. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let's let's go with the inspiration. Well, I feel like I start with kind of like an idea in my mind, something that I'm visualizing inside, and then I try to. I need something to look at because it's really difficult, unless it's an abstract, to just. Um, capture something like realistically without having um, a source or a guide to go off of. So I like to, and you're the same way. So having like photos to look at, but I'll see something and then I'll try to like make that concrete with um, kind of layering different images together and sometimes using abstract art to like mm -hmm. mesh it. So I think, um, you know, the most important thing, um, you know, Picasso said, uh, inspiration will find you working. So I think the most important thing is to develop a habit of painting. Um, always be working. And if you, if you aren't inspired in a direction and you don't have already like a series that you're working on, uh, then maybe experiment. And uh, through discovery, through playing, uh, something will spark your inspiration. Your inspiration will ignite. Uh, so I really think that developing a habit of, of painting and creating on an ongoing, regular basis, you will always be inspired. Always, always, always. I can't remember in the last... I can't remember ever in my, in my career of lacking inspiration or not having something I want to paint. Um, the entire time during my career, for the last 30 years, I have more ideas than I know what to do with. Um, I have pages and pages of journals, of written ideas. I have ideas stored in my heart. I have, I have so many ideas and things that I want to create because I think I I've, I've have a habit of creating for the last 30 years. So that's your number one thing that you want to foster is don't worry about what inspires you. Don't worry about getting um, inspiration. Just concentrate on building a habit of creating. Yeah. And that will always bring you inspiration. I agree. Yeah, I totally agree. I would say for myself, inertia is the hardest part. Yeah, <laughs> getting Absolutely. started. So like what you were saying, Ellie, um, when you stay in motion, an object that is in motion tends to stay in motion. So yeah, that's excellent. Um, it's just physics, really. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, I actually feel like we could do an entire workshop on how to find inspiration. That's a good um, idea. Lots of people were asking about yeah. inspiration. I think that's a, a great idea. Um, let's ask this one last question and then wrap it up. So. Um, the Blissful Wizard <laughs> wants to know, how, does the mastery program cover in depth how to grow social media pages and procuring gallery representation? Yes, yeah. both those things. Um, we both share on uh, how to approach galleries, how to you know contact them. Um, what to say, what kind of questions to ask galleries, how to be prepared for, for yeah. a gallery representation. How do you know when you're ready? Uh, for a gallery, um, the fact that you're producing a portfolio um, and a body of work that's cohesive makes you gallery ready. Um, having an artist statement, a bio, all those 
all that marketing collateral that we teach you step by step how to create gets you completely prepared uh, to contact a gallery. So we go into depth with all of that, how mm -hmm. to follow up with a gallery, um, what's fair, uh, fair contracts, percentages, all those things, the different types of galleries, how can you discern while looking online which gallery is right for you and which isn't. I mean, it is very in depth. Um, also with uh, social media and branding, um, oh, she, she didn't, he didn't ask branding. It was uh, social, social media. media. Um, we, uh, we definitely teach you that um, and kind of from different perspectives because uh, Dimitra, you know, is, has, you know, a large following. Um, and, and so she teaches like, what did she do to get that? And how does she um, facilitate and, and maintain that? And then I have, I have had, she was kind of this overnight, um, you know, social media success. And I've had this sort of slow build uh, in it um, consistently and steadily uh, growing my social media. So having those two perspectives of, you know, sort of virality versus, you know, slow and steady, um, uh, you know, you you see kind of a, a, a wide breadth of, of really how to do it, how to create content plans, how to stick with that, um, creating all kinds of different content and um, connecting with your audience and using that connection to bring value so that you do get more followers, uh, but also um, utilizing it and converting it to sales. So, um, so yeah, all of that is covered in the mastery program. Um, I just wanted to read this real quick just because it came in last week. Um, so one of our students, Jackie Davis, just sent us an email, um, wrote us this, you know, um, shared her experience. So she said, hi, Ellie. I was a student of Milaner Institute in 2020 and 2021. I just wanted to share, I had my first sale in an art gallery. I've sold over 20 pieces since graduating, but this sale was the most exciting. I know I couldn't have done it without your course. I was, I was one of those ones that had talent and put it aside for 20 years uh, plus for marriage and kids, your course helped me to step out and find my true purpose, and your program gave me the skills and courage I never knew that I had. I think you all you all are so inspiring and authentic, which is what drew me to, com to commit to the school. Thank you so much for teaching me to find my confidence and my strength to know my worth and success is to come. You have been a gift to me. Cheers, Jackie Davis. Oh, oh that's so cool. That's so amazing. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. yeah. Well, we are, uh, we are just so excited because we believe right now is the best time to be an artist. Uh, there are so many opportunities around us all the time. And I believe the mastery program is an incredible opportunity. If you're not already in it, um, you should very, very much consider uh, getting involved and joining us. Uh, we believe that we are a part of a huge worldwide movement and that we are gonna change the world with, with the art that we create. And uh, we are just super excited. That's such a fantastic community. And uh, we urge you to get on uh, the pre-registration uh, wait list uh, so that you can access uh, a prep course that will really help you get prepared. It's totally free. Uh, so I think Jake will put the link in the chat right now. You can just join it, um, you know, right now and start getting involved uh, with that free prep course. Um, uh, you'll learn so many things. You're going to love it. Um, join our app. Uh, uh, it's app.milanart.com. Uh, or you can go to the app store and just download Milan Art uh, and join the app. Uh, there's a thriving community on there. You can connect with students. You can ask questions. Um, I'm sure a lot of the people watching this workshop are already on the app. Uh, many of them are in the mastery program. So you can connect with them and get all your questions answered um, and just kind of see, uh, test the waters before you commit and, and check it out. So um, anyway, we're very excited for you and we're so glad that you joined us today. Mm -hmm. I hope you were inspired and you really learned something about composition and um, we enjoyed it and we will see you next time. Yep.